and welcome to Mentality Meets. Conversations that explore mental health stories and strategies to help leaders like you change the culture of mental health in the workplace. I'm Peter Larkham. I'm a mental health instructor and expert and your host for today. Now, today we're going to be talking with James Withy. So James is the author of the best-selling book, How to Tell Depression to Piss Off. And he's currently writing the follow-up of How to Tell Anxiety to Sod Off. Now, in this session, James encourages us to separate depression from the person, to meet it with an emotion that will enable you to attack it. And he helps us understand how suicidal thoughts become a logical process. Now, I also got struck by the notion that mental health illness is a life-threatening illness, which is currently impacting on the lives of one in three adults in the UK. Now, before we get into this interview, I know it's well overdue, but I'm going to say it anyway. And this is our first episode of the new year and a new season. So, Happy New Year to everybody and welcome to season three. So, I've got an announcement to make. This year, I've kicked off a new mental health initiative called Mindshift Forum 2021 to put into practice mental health habits and attitudes. You know, I see it everywhere. We are all struggling to stay afloat. And Mindshift Forum is all about walking the talk of mental health to help us live better in 2021. So each month, I send you a short email with a practical challenge. Now this month, it's been about connecting with those around you. So I've reconnected with my aunt, who's only socialised with my mum and dad for the last year. Um, So we now have a Zoom every other week, and we talk about her memories from her life. And so Mindshift Forum 2021 also includes a monthly live video with me. Now this month we're doing Mentality Meets, and next month we're going to be doing something brand new, which is a live discussion and question answer called Pete Larkham Live. Yes, it does mean that our schedule has changed for Mentality Meets this year, mostly to keep it fresh and enable me to manage the process better. So if you want to get access to these monthly challenge emails, as well as access to the Pete Larkham Live and Mentality Meets, then you can sign up from the website. It's all completely free. You've just got to go to peterlarkham.com and sign up. And now for all those watching on YouTube, like this video, leave a comment and hit the subscribe button to get all the latest content to help you with your mental health journey. Let us know in a comment below what you want to hear about in the future and share with your friends and family. You can also check out all that we have on offer at peterlarkham.com. Now, let's not wait any longer. Here's my conversation with James Withy as we talk openly and honestly about depression. And so James, I just want to take this moment and invite you to introduce yourself to us. Why are we talking to you today? Which is a, a weird question <laughs> in itself. Um, but yeah, so just give us a little bit of a, an introduction as to who you are. So yeah, hello everybody. It's, it, it's lovely to be here. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm someone with a lived experience of recurrent depression. So I still live with that and um, anxiety. Um, uh, I'm also an author and an editor, so um, my fourth book is coming out next year. Um, So yeah, I write about depression, I write about anxiety. Um, I'm the founder of something called The Recovery Letters, which is an online project of letters from people recovering depression um, and writing to those who are are currently affected by it, and that that turned into, into a book as well. So yeah, I'm also a husband and a cat owner and I work in a life. So yeah, I live in Brighton. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, And so we're going to be talking about depression. And one of the books that you've written is called Piss Off Depression, which is a great title, quite an emotive title. Um, And I had some people kind of say, for some reason, your email's kind of been flagged. And I kind of realised that it was because we'd written out the the piss off depression uh, in the context of the email. But what I want to ask you is just that concept that we can tell mental health illnesses to jog on. Is that, is that really a thing? And how do we, how do you kind of get to a point of believing that and experiencing it? Yeah. So the book's called How to Tell Depression to Piss Off. And, and, and it's, it's, so it's kind of, 
it's 40 ways of managing depression. And, but the kind of, I suppose, the uniqueness of it is that it takes a kind of more proactive piss off nuss. That word, let's call that word, um, attitude towards it. So, yes, a lot of times we have to accept that, that, that you know, we have, we have depression, but actually, anger and that motivation from anger also plays a huge part in us managing depression, which is kind of where the piss off part plays. Because you have to have a sense of fighting depression and it being a thing, even though it's inside your head, separating it out into the illness and then telling it to piss off is, is a really effective tool. And so these kind of tools for that particular book were kind of ones that I had, that I do constantly um, and ones that I tried. And, um, I, you know, I, I really admit that it's depression is not going to leave me. I have a diagnosis of recurrent depression. It, it 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 doesn't go. It's 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 showing no signs of leaving, unfortunately. But I have developed strategies of saying, actually, piss off depression. Um, I am still going to live my life. So it's kind of written from that point of view of I'm going to use this strategy and that strategy and this strategy in order to get my power over the illness because we can feel so dominated by depression. You can feel it, it feels so strong, so powerful, so all-consuming, that it's affected every part of our life. So actually, when we take a stance of going, no, piss off, you can use any swear word you want, actually. <laughs> it doesn't matter. We have spent a lot of time with the publishers discussing swear words. Um, but, so piss off is the one that, that, that we could kind of get away with without, without kind of um, Amazon freaking out too much. Um, but that kind of anger towards it is a very helpful tool. And we're often told, you know, anger is a really bad thing. We shouldn't be getting angry about stuff. But actually, it's not. It's quite natural for us to get angry about stuff. You know, of course, it's about what we do with it. But getting angry with an illness that is in our mind is a really helpful technique because it, it's like I'm saying, it brings our power back. I, I want to kind of step in at that point because... I, I, I like the context of actually getting angry about it. Mm. And because sometimes we can have such a passive view, you know, oh, okay, so that person's experiencing depression. And even if I were to support someone, there's still a passive process of, okay, they're, they're going through this. But actually, if there's a, a, a stronger emotion attached to it of that anger, that's not okay. This is not okay. And we need to fight it and we need to fight it hard. And, and seeing it in that light instead is actually really quite a powerful thing. Um, and now also I want to bring in the context that depression is different for every single person. So you get diagnosed with depression and I get diagnosed with depression. We're not experiencing the same thing. And so my question, which is going to go out to the audience, um, is basically around bad days. Okay. So if you've never had depression, um, we've all had bad days. And I want to ask, how does it feel? What are the, what, what's the kind of words that you can put to that? Because James, what I want to ask you is what words come to mind when you are in that place of experiencing depression? What, what would you say are the symptoms or certainly the feelings that come to mind for you? Yeah, it, 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 it's a really good question. It, it's such a hard thing to describe if you've never had it. Um, so, so for me, there's a profound sense of hopelessness. Almost as if any hope that has been around me at all has gone. And not only has it gone, it also is also the feeling that it's never, ever going to come back again. So it's not just that it's disappeared and you can go, oh, you know, it, it's, it's gone for a little while. It's so much more than that. It's gone and it's never coming back. And that's, that's the kind of crucial bit. Um, for me, it's also a profoundly excruciating emotional pain. So on, on, on such a level that it incapacitates you. Um, so it means that at times I can't move, I can't get out of bed. Um, doing any simple task is, is like wading through mud. 
So it, it's it's every single small action is incredibly incredibly difficult. Um, often it feels like um, there's a huge blanket on me, um, but that blanket has got nails in. It's a really heavy blanket, so I can't see properly um, in this blanket. But it's also got nails that keep going into my body. This. There's a lot of stuff going on in there. <laughs> yeah. And it it's so powerful and, and necessary to to explore this further. And and the one that kicks out for me is that hope or the loss of hope. Because if we can understand that, I mean, for me, kind of the bad days is, is more that I just I can't. I, it's not that I can't get out of bed. It's that I can't be bothered to get out of bed. It's So it's different isn't it? Because I can still get out of bed. Uh, and the way that I try and figure it out in my head is when you have been really ill that you can't get out of bed, apart from literally to kind of get to the toilet or, or whatever. But there's that, everything is being, the whole, everything's just being sucked out of you, you know? Um, but even when you are in a place of health, and I look back at when I was ill and in bed, there's this kind of detachment in that I sometimes think, and I don't know whether I'm the only person, so again, question out to the audience, but I sometimes think, was I really that ill? Or was I just faking it because I couldn't be bothered to get out of bed? There's still that question of a detached nature. And that's kind of my next question to you, James, which, when we've kind of seen what, what's in the chat bar, is when you are in a healthy place, can you associate with those feelings or, or, or do they feel a little bit distant as a half forgotten dream okay so that's going to be the question i'm coming to you with but let's kind of see what what people have been saying in the context of uh the symptoms anthony's just kind of saying i can't even bring a smile to my face on those bad days uh can't see good in anything and i think that's a really telling uh sign in the context of depression um nikki says it's the feeling of being smothered and unable to breathe so similar to what you were saying about that blanket being over you. Paul says the feeling of impending doom as if something bad is about to happen, but you quite don't, you don't quite know what it is and um, feeling negative about everything. And yeah, Anthony then goes to negative thinking, which is stuck in a loop and this catastrophizing. And Matt says a bad day for me feels like a complete loss of control. Uh, sorry, loss of control uh, and physical pressure. Everything is too much. Uh, sound like like and feelings both physical and mental uh the feeling of just wanting to get away from everything you know and that almost a a sense of hypersensitivity uh in the context of what i'm hearing from matt uh and victoria saying want to sink into my bed under the blanket with a hood on it's like proper just kind of cozy cozy me up um and so just kind of coming back to to that uh context around Actually, I can't remember what my, my question was. That's, that's No, I remember. I remember. You, okay, you I, think, I think, yeah, sorry, my memory. Part of depression symptoms is a really bad memory. So, uh, <laughs> I think what you were saying is, is could, I, could I remember, ironically, um, that, that bad time when I'm feeling more well? I think it's a bit rough, yeah. Um, and yes, I can. Um, I can remember that, yeah. Um, so I even though, to, and to the extent that it terrifies me that it's going to happen again, yeah. Um, because a lot of the time, the extent that what my depression does is, is, is takes, it, I have extreme suicide ideation and have attempted suicide multiple, multiple times. Uh, but I'm still here, so, so yeah. <laughs> that's, just, that's a spoiler alert. I mean, because um, that, that, well, I mean, that in itself is, just fascinating. Um, mm. And again, suicide is one of those conversations that we don't like. And we've actually kind of tackled it a number of times on, on the different mentality meets because it's such an important topic. Because when we are talking about mental health, that is kind of your worst case scenario is that suicide ideation and the attempting suicide and uh, the now, okay, phrasing the completing suicide. Now, I've had a number of situations just this year, actually, uh, in the last few courses I've done about the, the word of completing suicide and that there seems to be a certificate that needs to go with it. Congratulations, you completed. Um, which is, again, a weird dynamic because as a mental health first aid instructor, that is 
the language that we're taught to use instead of the committing suicide. And I can, I can get a sense that this language is shifting and changing again as people are beginning to explore. Hang on. How do we talk about suicide and the, the impact that it has and getting to that place of, of the ideation? And just kind of come back and Victoria just says, it's more of a hiding rather than a cozy. I think I kind of said that kind of cozying up. <laughs> it's like, no, it's definitely not a cozy no, no, experience. No, no. <laughs> it's much more of that kind of hiding. And, um, uh, Kay Gregor says, uh, as a friend of others, I see them isolating and withdrawing from that social interaction and just kind of wanting to get away from it. And so the, the other side for me in the context of as we talk about depression and the, the size of the symptoms and what you're experiencing and this whole idea of that we can kind of tell it to, to jog on and coming back to that anger and that, uh, forcefulness is how do we help people find hope again? So that's, that's my next question, James. How can we, so can I, as Pete Larkham, supporting you as James when you're in that place, yep. can yep. I help you find hope again? Yeah, a- absolutely. Absolutely. You, you can. Um, it, it's just, it's working against what depression is telling you. So, to, and so what I do is I isolate depression as a thing so so for me i use a lot of imagery imagery and metaphors in the way to manage my depression so i imagine depression as a cuckoo um and cuckoos take over nests and so my depression is a cuckoo that is that is in my nest and i hit it <laughs> very 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 hard you don't need to call the rspb it's all metaphorical cookies it's fine but i i hit i hit the cuckoo so I say to myself, this is depression. This is depression talking. This is this is this isn't you. This is the illness. So when we separate out the illness from ourselves, and then we can get in touch with who we are. So it, it's like when you're separating the yolk and I don't eat eggs, but um, um the yolk and the white of an egg. If you separate the two out, you can, you can sort of see the two distinctly. So what I do is I separate out the thoughts that are depression and the rest of me and now it feels like because i've got this big sort of horrible blanket on that there isn't any of me there but there is but by going ah so this hood or this cover or this blanket or this cuckoo is depression and isn't me and then i tap into the things that that are me so i concentrate on the things that i can do i concentrate on the person that i am i I do lists of lists and lists of things of jogs and memories. But the main thing that I do is if I start beating the cuckoo about the chest, I can go, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. I am not going to be dominated by you. I'm not going to be dominated by you. Um, and that that gives me strength. And so when I feel some sense of power over it, that hope seems to creep back in. There's lots of other techniques of prompts of about, um, you know, seeing what's in your life, but, but you can't do that until you've addressed the cuckoo. So, so for example, a lot of people will, will, you know, say, oh, someone's having a really bad episode of depression will go, oh, but, you know, look at the lovely flowers. And, and, there, and there's a bunny on a hill. As if the flowers and the bunny on the hill are going to be enough. They're not. They're not going to be enough to meet depression. But what you can do is face the depression head on and go, right, this is depression. I'm not going to be beaten down by you. I am better than you. You are a pillock. And I'm not going to have you rule my life. So I take a very strong, angry stance about it and go, I'm not going to let you stop me. This is absolutely brilliant. Like absolutely brilliant. Um, and there's a couple of things that are coming out that I want to try and explore a little bit further, if at all possible. Um, and the first one is that phrasing that can so easily creep in, which is, uh, it sounds like you're going through some really hard stuff, but at least this is okay. You know, and that's that kind of, at least there's a, at least there's a, a, a robin on the fence going back to the kind of the beautiful stuff. At least the, at least the flowers are out. At least it's sunny. And we, we miss the intensity of what someone is experiencing and, and feeling. And we try and, um, uh, Brené Brown describes it as silver lining it. We try and find, 
a, 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 a positive edge. But by doing that, we often then dismiss what it is that this person is going through. And I was on a course the other day uh, and a guy said, you know, what? it's not just other people doing that to me. It's me doing it to myself. And I think a lot of us have fallen into that in the context of this lockdown period. But at, at least I haven't got that going on. At least this is. And we minimalize our own experience of what we're struggling with uh, in the belief that we shouldn't really feel like this, you know, and that kind of at least context and, and framework. And um how, how then, this comes back to you, how, and this is a question for the audience, actually, I want you to, to give me your thoughts. How do we avoid that minimalizing process? How do we just sit with someone? Uh, because when we talk about empathy, we talk about finding something within ourselves that resonates with what the person's going through. But actually, what you're talking about, James, I haven't experienced. I haven't got to that point where I feel like I've got blankets with nails kind of pinning me down. So how can I sit with that in a place and just go, wow, thanks for telling me about this. Give us some tips. It, it, it's it's a case of because naturally as someone as a carer of somebody or someone a loved one that you want to bring them towards the light so we naturally kind of want to bring them towards the living but so when my depression is really bad you know there is a it's like i want people to imagine that there is a big large space and it's hitting me on the front of the head it's doing this but no one you don't want to talk about the spade so actually, what do you want to talk about is the fact that, you know, I'm going on holiday or, you know, you know the lovely flowers. Um, but, but I'm going, but there's a huge frigging spade and it's hitting me in the front. Why aren't we talking about the spade hitting me in the front of the head? And, and so you can't get into the space of talking about the light stuff and the motivation and the hope until you talk about the spade hitting me. So... It, it becomes incredibly irritating when someone is going, look at the bunnies, look at the flowers, blah, 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 blah. You're going, but can you not see that there's a spade hitting me in the front of the head? So, and that's why we get this disconnect with uh, people that support us because we just they go, and we then go, well, you just don't get it. You just don't get it. So, and, sorry, and what that, what that then does is it stops people from seeking help. And the other thing which I wanted to, to come back to is you were saying that you separate yourself from your depression. So you kind of make it into this, this animal, the cuckoo, uh, that you beat with a stick. Not really, so don't worry, um, but metaphorically. Because I want to try and explore with you the context that I've come across, which is when people own their illnesses. And the illness has become a part of who they are and a part of their personality and their character. And it becomes increasingly difficult to actually separate them from their illness because they seem to have owned it. Um, and I'm trying to understand and explore. And again, apologies first and foremost for my ignorance in this, because when you're in that place, does it merge and is it a real fight to, to again, pull it, pull it back and to, to separate it? Because again, I don't want to dismiss this in a kind of, I just don't get it. So jog on kind of moment. Um, and I want to try and understand how do we help people pull, pull their mental health illness away from the person that they are when it feels all encompassing and is literally impacting on everything? So it, it, it takes some training. So it's about awareness. So I know the, the voice of my depression and then I know my voice. So it does it does merge. So it feels like it's all me. And because it's in my mind, therefore, it's much harder to separate because I can't go. Uh, so I fell off my bike the other week. I can go, oh, I've hurt my wrist. I can see my wrist. Blah, blah, blah. Much harder to do because it's meshed in with our personalities and our minds and our thoughts. But I also know that the type of thoughts and types of hate speech that depression is telling me. So I recognize its voice. So I know the voice of depression now much more. And it means that I can go, ah, ha, ha, I see you. I can hear you. I can hear that voice. And that voice is depression. Because it's not the same voice as when I'm well. 
so I can go, okay, so if I can go that way, and it takes effort because there's lots of other things, counteractive things going, no, no, it's just you being an idiot and, you know, you're a bunch of camel poo and just, you know, but actually the more that you can go, this is depression, this is the voice of depression. Um, and that really helps me because I can go, right, I, I see what it is and that means I can try and separate it out and that gives me wriggle room. And it gives me room for me to come in and depression to start to dissipate. Um, and it, has, it takes some effort and it takes some practice, but it's, it's, it's so worth doing because otherwise, if we have this complete mesh, then it just feels like we are ruled and overtaken. But if we can start to do this and start to go, ah, depression voice and my well voice, and I can start to recognize the two, then it has less power on it. So yeah, it's really important that, so you can start to write down the ways that the, the sentences and words that, that depression will say to you. I want to just kind of pick up on that, the the voice of depression and kind of being able to, to hear that it's a different voice to, to my normal voice. Um, because there's something that is, it, it's kind of, chomping at me and I don't know how to ask it um and uh, again want to precursor it with an with an apology because um there's something in me as someone who hasn't experienced this that I don't get it and I I, I understand that <clears throat> and that's even kind of being a, a trainer for 10 years in mental health um don't get it because earlier you were saying about that suicidal ideation and having attempted suicide multiple times and there is something in me that is, is wanting to say, but James, you've, you've just said that you can tell that this is a different voice to the healthy voice that you have. So when you find those suicidal ideation, what is it that's stopping you from being able to just go, no, that's, that's not what I want to do, leading you to a place of actually attempting and, and finding that absolute place of desperation and, uh, this can be a very hard topic to, to talk about. And so I, oh, that's no. why I want to apologize to, to start with. But can you no, kind no, of so. help me understand that, please? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I mean, these take, I probably, you know, my last suicide attempt was um, maybe a year and a half ago. So I have finally tuned these, um, a lot of these techniques. And that has made me have much less suicide attempts. I still have suicidal ideation. But I've had much, much, much fewer attempts because I've been able to distinguish between between the two. Um, I, I guess be- beforehand, I, I think the, for me, the suicide stuff is about escape from pain. So one of the really, really important things with depression is, is, is to remember that people are trying to escape pain. And the pain is so acute that you will do anything to escape it anything to escape it and that escape so means often for some people means taking taking their life or attempting to take their life um so i want to i want to jump in because that that actually really resonates with one of the statements that we kind of teach in the youth mental health first aid course that says suicide isn't chosen but it happens when the pain exceeds the resources we have to cope with that pain and from what I'm hearing is that actually it gets to a place where you just want this to stop and you can't see any other way of it stopping than that next step and what that also does for me James is I constantly talk about the brain being a fantastically logical machine and so when you begin to to hear that I just want this to stop you can actually see where the suicidal ideation becomes the next logical step in the context of someone's mental ill health. Um, and that's where I, I try and kind of fight people to say, no, don't, don't judge it because it's not a chosen act. It's not like they've woken up and go, all oh, right, this, this seems like a good idea, except it does in their head because it's the next logical step in a process that they've been on for a long period of time. Does that sound about right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it's a case of, so what, what I, I do now when it gets really, really bad is that I have some sleeping pills and I have an arrangement with my psychiatrist is that I will take those sleeping pills and I'll go to sleep. So 
that will be one of my ways of when it gets really, 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 really bad. So rather than taking an attempt on my life, um, I, 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 I will go to sleep. I'll knock myself out and go, go to sleep. And she's like, yeah, fine, on you go, <laughs> do, 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 do that. And it, and it knocks me out because it's a pain that is unbearable to live with. And I think it's really hard to, and certainly, you know, I, I mean, I've had suicidal relation probably, you know, since my team, but I, I, I know full well how hard that is to get to grips with as a concept. If you've never experienced that, it just, and I've spoken to friends who are just going, I don't get it, I don't understand. How can you get to that point? And I've tried to go, yeah, it's about, and it is, it feels like a logical step because it's like, well, if this is unbearable pain, how do I get rid of the unbearable pain? So I can't, it's not like, you know, so with my wrist, I can take some painkillers. Can't, can't do that. Um, it, you know, there is no, you know, I, I can, you know, some people will have, have alcohol or they'll take drugs, but actually that pain isn't going to go away. It just numbs it. So if that pain is ongoing, then it will feel like the next natural step is to take your life. Um, I also know that at that point, depression has, it, it is so strong that I, I, I need to do something and I need to seek help. So I am able to separate out the two. Yeah. To ask you, probably to, to kind of give me your, your closing thoughts around this kind of, we, we've talked about the anger and actually meeting depression with a stronger emotion so as we can actually fight it and, and come to it with a mindset that we need to fight this. We've talked about pulling it away from who we are so as we can separate who we are uh, into uh, that depression is having an impact on us, but it isn't who we are. It's not, a, it's not us. Um, we've also talked about the impact of the voice that kind of is talking to you is different to when you're in a healthy place. We, we've talked all over the place on this. Um, and so I want you to take a moment, if you can, and just encourage our audience with some practical steps, practical tips on if they know someone who is struggling, how to how to best reach into that situation. But also if they begin to experience it for themselves, maybe for the first time, maybe for a reoccurring time, how how can they reach out to someone uh, to also access the help and support. So those are the kind of two ways, if I'm supporting someone or if I'm experiencing yeah. it for myself. I, I think if you're experiencing it for yourself, um, the first step is to, if there is somebody alongside you that you can tell them about, who can act as a cheerleader for you and help you access help. But, but the, biggest, the biggest kind of hurdle initially is because there will be so many voices in your head going, you don't deserve this, you don't deserve this, you don't deserve this. People are much more deserving than me. This isn't serious enough. I, I'm not having suicidal thoughts. I can't be that ill. I, you know, I, I am undeserving of help. And that will be replaying and replaying and replaying. And try and you need to try and have an answer to that, which is that, well, if, if I'm not good enough, then who is? So who, who, who is then good enough? Yeah. So, and then you have to try and get some support with getting help, if that makes sense. So what I talk about in, in, in one of the books is, is about having somebody alongside you. So you do the calling to the, the GP or the, the mental health client, whoever it is, but have a cheerleader beside you along, along the way. So it's really important to take responsibility for your mental health, and that really helps you sort of accept that it's going on. But you need someone beside you. Now that might that could be anybody. It could also be a mental health line helping you to do that. Um, so, and then you have to push. I'm afraid, due to the nature, <coughs> excuse me, due to the nature of funding and the nature of services, you have to push when you don't feel like you want to push, and you get, might have to keep pushing for help. So, if you get a oh, we've got an appointment in six months' time, you might need to go. That's that's not okay, and that's where your cheerleader comes in handy to go. Actually, I think you need to push a bit harder. I think you need to get some something sooner. Um, also, if you speak to one particular GP that is doesn't feel like it's getting gets quite getting you, and this has happened to me multiple or multiple occasions where I've had mental health professionals and they haven't 
understood what's going on for me. I've had to go back and back and back and back. So, so please keep pushing until you find the support that's right for you. And that might mean multiple, multiple attempts. Um, it also might mean that sometimes when we meet with um, professionals, we don't always get the service that we deserve. So be prepared for there sometimes for there not to be a great match between you and them, but that's just one person you might need to try some somebody else. GP is the normal, you know, normal way of, of, of going to get access, and you'd have to go to your GP to get to secondary psychiatric services, which is the services that I'm with. So that would be your, your first point of call. You can always ask for a double appointment. And especially with mental health, I would ask for a double appointment with your GP. Because five minutes talking about your mental health is 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 not is not enough. Um, always try and get a double appointment so you can go in, in, into more detail. Um, also, I suppose in terms of supporting others, it's trying to be okay with listening to the darkness. You have to be able to listen to the darkness and not think that listening to the darkness is going to make the darkness worse. It won't. It will not make the darkness worse. They're talking about suicide. And then you talk to them about those suicidal thoughts. That not make suicide. That is not going to prompt them to go and do it. In fact, the complete opposite. There will be a huge relief from them talking, being able to talk about those suicidal thoughts. That is absolutely crucial. And the same with depression. If you're talking about the dark thoughts they're having, that is not going to increase the dark thoughts. It's going to let the dark thoughts come out and vent and have room to talk. So there's all this stuff going inside of us and it's got to come out somehow. And if you can be alongside somebody when they're talking about the dark stuff, then that in itself is really powerful. You don't need to be the fixer. You don't need to go, oh, well, crochet. Crochet is going to fix this. We're going to do crochet. You, know, you don't need to do that. You don't. If they want to seek support, you can be alongside them. But you don't need to be the fixer. You just need to be the person sat alongside them. Okay, uh, let's kind of just put that uh, back into kind of just a, a couple of bullet points because th- there's so much stuff there, James, and that's just brilliant. Um, and so kind of what I was hearing, and if I've missed anything, let me know on the chat bar. But what I was hearing is make sure you have a cheerleader, somebody who's going to be with you, who's going to champion you, who's going to support you and push you. Uh, don't be afraid to get a double appointment with your GP ask for it because it's not going to be offered but take more of their time so as you can get to what it is that you need to talk about those appointments may also be good to take your cheerleader with you for because one of the things which i often hear in the training course is that you go to the doctor and the doctor says how are you and our response is yeah i'm all right why are we there if we're okay you know um and so the cheerleader can help you to verbalize how bad it is because sometimes we don't want to say how bad it is because we don't like it but we've got to be honest with that um what i also heard was don't be afraid to push when they come back and they say okay we'll put you on a waiting month uh, waiting list here here you go six to eight months that's not okay that's not good enough i need it sooner and don't be afraid to push um the other thing which i have also kind of picked out on on that is uh get a second opinion if the GP doesn't seem to be getting it, or if you don't feel like you're getting the support you need, get a second opinion. Go to a different GP or get, get a different appointment um, and say, there's more. I need, I, th- there's more. Okay. Um, there's a couple of questions which are coming out and, and I want to begin to focus in on these because these are good stuff. Um, so yeah, just, just don't be afraid to get help. I think that's the, the biggest thing is that if you begin to feel it for yourself, or if you notice somebody is struggling, get them the help. And the last bit that you said was don't be afraid to talk about suicide. And I think during this year, I think one of the Pete Larkham live sessions that I'm going to do uh, is going to be around how we open up that conversation just to give people a little bit more um, confidence in how to have those conversations. Because it, it feels like it's going to be a scary conversation and it doesn't need to be. So I think I'm going to focus one of the Pete Larkham live sessions on that. OK, James, let's come back to these questions then. So question number one. Question number one, I feel like I'm in a pub quiz. Uh, so question number one, I assume you're on regular medication. Uh, have you found that it helps? Good question, Jane. Yeah, I, I am on regular medication. So yeah, I'm on um, a drug called escitalopram, which is an antidepressant. 
um, also I'm on uh, medication for my sleep. So insomnia is a huge, huge, huge part of depression. And um, my insomnia has been fairly terrible since this for about 10 years, really. So yeah, I take two drugs to get to sleep at the moment. And I'm, I'm sort of in the process of my psychiatrist of, of kind of reducing that and reducing that. Um, you have to be really careful, really careful with sleep medication um, because it can be very quick, you can quickly get dependent on it and go into withdrawals from med that medication, which I have done multiple times. And it's, it's brutal stuff. So, yes, um, I've been on lots and lots of different types of med um, antidepressants and combinations of antidepressants and, <coughs> excuse me, antipsychotics. They have worked. Yeah, absolutely. So, when I was, uh, First, this last period, so which I sort of think of in the last sort of 10 years, um, when it got particularly severe, I was described an antidepressant and an antipsychotic get together because that's often quite effective. And, and yes, I, after four weeks, there was a snap, but like a snap in my brain, um, and, and something changed. And they do, they do absolutely help me, they do. And I've come to accept that I am going to be on antidepressants. And, you know, the rest of my life, and that's and that's okay. Often, um, so every few years, I normally have to change them. So they, sort of, you know, they, I grow a tolerance to them, or something's not quite working, and I don't quite know why that is. You're a psychiatrist, don't know why that is, but um, so often I've changed them. It's also about finding a combination or medication that uh, you can tolerate the side effects. So, um, which is kind of the holy grail, really, of, of, of antidepressant medication. Can you does it work? Can you tolerate the side effects? Um, some medications I've been on, the side effects have been so horrific. I'm just like, this is just not worth it. It's just not worth it. I can't function. So yes, um, there are many, many, many types of antidepressants. If the antidepressant is not working for you because you're not, it's not benefit from you, or the side effects are getting too much, then ask for another one because again, that will not always be offered. There are many. So for the last ten years. I have been on countless types of different types of antidepressants. There are many, many, many out there. Don't get fobbed off by going, oh, well, are we only prescribe Prozac. It's nonsense. So again, you may well have to push, but do not tolerate antidepressants that aren't working or, you're, or you can't tolerate the side effects. Brilliant. Thank you, James. Uh, so uh, Paul then says, uh, am I the only one who sits in a daze in my own little bubble thinking negative things and then suddenly realise that I've been sat there for 20 or 30 minutes? Uh, Victoria then goes, me, last year. Uh, is that a symptom that you've experienced, James, where you just feel like time disappears? Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, oft often what happens when my depression is bad is, is that my brain kind of switches off. Um, and I, it's kind of what my husband calls my kind of goldfish bowl moments where he can't, I can't really be get, got at. So, you know, it feels like there's a, there's a big sort of glass bowl in between me and me and the world. And, and I can be sad. It's sort of, for me, I think it's when pain reaches a peak and then your body goes, oh, I can't cope, I have to shut down. And, and it's, like, it's, it's like a protection mechanism, basically. And it's, it's a, in a way, it's a good thing to happen because you, you, it's your brain going, you need to rest and you need to stop. And, and recovery in terms of depression, rest is absolutely, absolutely vital. So those moments where you're, you're, you know, you're in that daze or you, you know, time has passed is a good thing because that is part of the healing process. So kind of go with it, go with those moments um, and don't think, oh my God, I wasn't you know, um, able to do whatever, whatever it might be. It's okay to have the moments. In fact, I would say it's good to have those moments because it's your brain going, right, you are now going to rest and stop and, and not be in that terrible space for a while. That's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, and then the, the last question that I've got coming up is around the, the sleeping pills. Uh, and apart from sleeping pills, is there anything else that uh, helps with it? Uh, and I, I suppose kind of what I want to read into that, and I might be reading it wrong, uh, Karen, is... Um, medication, yes, is what we've been saying. And there's lots of different types of medication and it, it does help. But I think also it's about what else, what other things outside of the medication that can help boost and improve our mental health? There are, there are hundreds of things. There are literally 40 things in the book. But there are 
many, many ways of, of doing that. So exercise gets talked about a lot and that, that may or may not help. But for me, it's about, usually for me, it's about how I'm viewing depression, what I'm saying to myself, how I'm battling it, um, how I've characterized it, what imagery I'm using with it. Um, a lot of the time it's about rewarding myself for even doing tiny things with a kind of mini games. It's really important depression. It is about rest, 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 and rest, and rest. If you're, if you're not resting, if you have some severe depression and you're not able to rest, it's going to take so much longer to get better. You have to view severe depression, bipolar, postpartum as something in, it is a life-threatening illness. So you have to treat it as a life-threatening illness, like cancer. And unless we start treating it like that, you won't take it seriously enough to do the things that you need to do because it is life-threatening. James, I've just had a light bulb moment in that statement. I've never seen mental health illnesses as a life-threatening illness. Mm. They are. They are. They are. They are one of the most life-threatening illnesses. Um, you know, it is. And unless we think about it like that, then we diminish what we're experiencing. Because you know, uh, we know that the, the death rates with, with eating disorders. I, I had an anorexia in my twenties. Just add into the mix of loveliness. <laughs> oh, I've got a whole range of stuff, Peter. We've got, we've got, yeah, we go well. um, But if we is one of the one of the very high death rates, you know, depression, the suicide rates are incredibly high. What we are dealing with the life threatening illnesses. So it's not enough to go. Oh, I'll take a few days of work. You have to treat this really seriously, and you have to say to yourself, "I need to treat this seriously." Now, society may be saying a whole other bunch of crap about it, like fully tell to W snowflake, you know, probably. Um, but that is not enough. You have to treat it incredibly seriously because it is life threatening. I I have a feeling that that is probably a great place to to draw all this to a close. And I have to admit, that's actually kind of made me tingle quite a bit because I've just never seen it like that before. And I don't know why I've never seen it like that before. Because surely, if we knew or understood that mental health illnesses was a life-threatening illness, we would do everything in our power to prevent against it, wouldn't we? We would, we would, we would do everything. But, you know, so if we had, you know, I have a, uh, one of my best friends has, has cancer at the moment. He's having cancer treatment. He is doing everything that he can to survive his, his, his cancer. And we have to apply that same thing to us. The difficulty with us, with mental illness, is, is that we also have something else telling us that we're a pillar and we shouldn't be doing it. There is an extra challenge. There's an extra challenge to it because we also have another voice going, you don't deserve to be alive. But we have to listen to the other voice going, this is life-threatening and we're going to do everything that we can to fight and to survive. James, thank you so much for your insight. Thank you so much for your honesty. Um, and just kind of leading us through this topic of depression, I have... I have got so much out of this. I hope you as my audience have got so much out of this as well. Thank you so much for the amount of chat that has been going on and the engagement that you've had. I, I and James have really appreciated that. Thank you for your questions uh, and for just engaging with us in this conversation. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of Mentality Meets. I have been Pete Larkham. You have all been absolutely awesome. This has been James Withy. Thank you so much. Take care. God bless. And bye bye now. Oh, what a great interview. Now, I love that we can beat depression with an anger that matches the impact it's having on our lives. Now, we can so easily meet mental health illnesses with this passive response. But you know what? The negative impact mental health has on people's lives is not okay. And we should get angry about it because it is stealing from people's lives. Now, you can find out more about James and connect with him through Speakers Collective org. And so next time, it is in two months time in April, we're going to be talking with Juliet Burton about eating disorders and the impact that this has personally as well as on our friends and family. So Juliet has a long history of mental health conditions and has been diagnosed with anorexia, anxiety disorders, bipolar disorders, 
body dysmorphic disorder, bulimia, compulsive overeating disorder, depression, and obsessive compulsive disorder. And yet she continues on her ongoing journey of recovery. Now, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Mentality Meets. And no matter where you are on your journey of mental health, you can find plenty of content and information about our resources at peterlarkham.com, including one of our mental health courses for you and your business. So don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find our entire back catalogue of conversations with mental health leaders and experts. Now, if you want to spread the word, drop us a review on the podcast app and share this with your friends. Thanks again for joining us for Mentality Meets, conversations that explore mental health stories and strategies that help leaders like you change the culture of mental health in your workplace.